to have a very high attendance um, last night and we thank you again for joining us tonight. We got today to bring you three different topics through cases and we hope that you benefit and that it relates to your practice. Without further ado, I will introduce our next, which is our first speaker. Um, um, I had the pleasure to working with Dr. Rodriguez on the COS last year and this year. And I will tell you that what struck me most about Amadeo was his earthy nature and his humility. People sometimes think that a few encounters with someone won't affect you, but it does. Amadeo showed me true authenticity and a genuine nature that you would enjoy being around. He's one of those who exude positive vibes without even trying. Um, here's, um, so Dr. Rodriguez is a neuro-ophthalmologist who works at McMaster University where he sees patients, teaches residents, and learns new stuff every day. Growing up in Argentina, he once dreamed of becoming a soccer player. Now in retrospect, he says, realizes he was just having hallucinations with delusional elaboration. I'm sure you would have, had, you would have made an excellent soccer player, Amadeo, but the neuro-ophthalmology world needed you more, and so that is why the new universe directed you to do that. Dr. Rodriguez is going to be talking to us today about visual hallucinations. Is it Charles Bonnet? Go ahead, Amadeo. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Beina, for your kind uh, introduction. Um, it is a, a great pleasure um, uh, just to be part of the COS uh, meeting. And, um, and I will be speaking tonight uh, about uh, visual hallucinations. Um, and we will talk about uh, the differential diagnosis of Charles uh, Bonnet syndrome. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, I have no financial disclosure. And specifically, we are going to talk about hallucinations, but in particular, uh, complex visual hallucinations, um, and in, in particular, those related to um, Charles Bonnet and the differential diagnosis. So I'm going to start by presenting a couple of clinical scenarios. So these patients were both referred to me for visual hallucinations. The first one was an 82-year-old woman with a history of hypertension diabetes and remote breast cancer that was complaining of seeing multiple geometric patterns like a brick wall. She also often sees small people uh, with colorful dresses. Uh, they do not really touch her, they do not really talk to her, and she recognizes that they are not real, but she's concerned that she's losing her mind. So the family is very concerned and the, the daughter who uh, comes in with her, uh, says that she's, uh, uh, she's good enough, she's on top of everything, but she needs a little bit of help with her finances because of her poor vision, but otherwise the patient is very socially active. So her visual acuity was 2400 on the right, 2200 on the left, um, as a result of macular degeneration. So the other clinical scenario is a different patient that was referred to me as well for visual uh, hallucinations um, with a history of hypertension on treatment. He often sees children in the room. Again, they do not really touch her, they do not really uh, talk to her, and she's not even afraid of them. Um, she didn't even tell her family about the hallucinations. So her daughter points that one day, uh, she asked her mom why she was cooking so much food and she said that she was cooking for the children. So she was cooking actually for those children she was um, seeing, right? So the family reports that she has like some good days and bad days in terms of uh, being aware of what's going on around her. Um, so even though she complains of poor vision, her visual acuity is not too bad. It's actually 2050 in both eyes, and she only has like moderate cataracts in both eyes. She is not driving anymore. She stopped uh, doing so at the request of the family because, um, I mean, she, she had like, a couple of near misses events, and on one occasion, she scraped the side of her on the door. So the family is concerned that the patient appears to be slow, but not just slow thinking, but, you know, she moves slow as well, right? Um, so during today's talk, we will try to elucidate what these two uh, patients may have, right? So um, if you are with me on, on this Sunday night, um, trying to uh, learn a little bit more of uh, neuro-ophthalmology, so we'll start by defining um, uh, 
uh, what hallucinations are, right? So hallucinations are perceptions that occur in the absence of any corresponding external sensory stimulus, right? So we, in ophthalmology, deal with visual hallucinations, but we can have, uh, or patients can have hallucinations in many different modalities, um, tactile, olfactory, auditory, and, and, and so on. So when it comes to visual hallucinations, we can classify them as unformed or simple. So those are like, you know, flashes, floaters, lines, dots, and formed hallucinations or complex hallucinations, which are more elaborate, um, just like uh, patients seeing people, animals, landscapes, and so on. Um, on the other hand, illusions are misinterpretations of a true sensory stimulus. For instance, the most common example is mistaking a rope for a snake. So we will deal tonight with hallucinations. And in ophthalmology, we have a, a broad a differential diagnosis, right? So uh, we can, uh, I mean, we often see patients with hallucinations in the setting of migraine. Uh, less commonly, we may actually come across patients presenting with visual hallucinations, seizures, which are, uh, I mean, occipital lobe seizures are usually uh, simple, uh, whereas temporal lobe uh, seizures can, can be complex. But I will focus tonight on um, release hallucinations, also known as Charles Bonnet syndrome, and the neurodegenerative conditions that may affect the same age group and may represent a diagnostic challenge um, when faced with patients uh, presenting with visual hallucinations. Due to time constraints, I am going to just briefly mention some other uh, conditions that may present with complex visual hallucinations as well. Um, so let me take you back to the 18th century, to Geneva, where a natural philosopher uh, named Charles Bonnet uh, is what is perhaps the first um, description of visual hallucinations in medical literature. So let me read an excerpt from it because uh, it contains all the core elements that, that we still uh, consider part of the, the syndrome that uh, still bears uh, his name. So I should tell you about the strange case that would be considered fabulous if not supported by testimonies of the highest credibility. I know a respectable man full of health, of ingenuousness, judgment, and memory who completely alert. There we have the description of someone that is cognitively intact. And independently from all outside influences, no external sensory stimulus. So it's recognizing that it's, uh, 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 there is insight. Uh, sees from time to time in front of him figures of men, of women, of birds, of carriages, of buildings. He sees these figures make various movements. However, these are only paintings because the men and women do not talk and no noise comes to his ear. So purely visual hallucinations, no auditory component. All of these appears to have its seat in the part of the brain that commands the sense of sight. The person I am talking about was subject at different times and at an advanced age to cataract operations on the two eyes. So it was a patient cognitively intact, who had insight into the uh, unreal nature of his pure visual hallucinations and was visually impaired. So the, pac the patient he was actually describing was uh, his grandfather, who was a magistrate that was very intelligent. And um, he was actually um, very pleased by these hallucinations and he provided a, a very detailed description of his visual experiences to uh, his grandson who actually published them. So uh, we are just talking about uh, something that was initially described in the 18th century. So is, is it still relevant to us? Let's go to the first question. Uh, if we can actually go ahead and, and show the, the first question. So this is to get your opinion. So just to, to know what you, uh, to see what you think. So Charles Bonnet syndrome is a rare condition, true or false? What do you think? Okay, so I think we can see the results. Just to see. False 61% through 39%. So um, in 
so that's okay. Thank you. We're going to move on to, uh, to the next slide. So let me tell you that uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome is not a rare condition. Actually, it is rare only in the experience of those that never ask about the, the, the condition because many times these patients experience visual hallucinations um, are afraid of coming forward. So they do not really come forward. They do not really uh, tell their doctors that, the, there is, uh, that they are having visual hallucinations um, and uh, because they are afraid of, uh, uh, of having a mental illness or an underlying psychiatric disturbance. So, and on the other hand, many times the many healthcare providers are not really aware of the condition either. So that's why it is important for us to, to know that it, uh, this condition does exist just to, proper, uh, to properly advise this patient and their families. So in a study published in 2016, uh, at the CJO, uh, in the CJO, um, uh, among 2,500 people seen at the CNAV uh, low vision clinic, um, almost 19% of patients um, reported having visual hallucinations. So it is not uncommon and uh, the prevalence is, uh, is for sure underestimated. So let's move to the next slide. So just like uh, Charles Bonnet's uh, grandfather, so people with this condition usually have visual impairment. And uh, so, but what is the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism? So why does it cause um, hallucinations? So the, the, one of the first proponents of visual hallucinations being uh, 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 when, uh, where he actually uh, described that the removal of normal visual impulses releases indigenous cerebral activity of the visual system. So essentially, um, what we know now, or one of the hypotheses, which is called uh, the differentiation hypothesis, uh, states that um, visual input that's not only provides us with information, about uh, our, our visual surroundings, but it also uh, suppresses the background cerebral activity in the visual cortex. Without this input, that background activity becomes kind of released uh, and people experience visual hallucinations. So now let's go to the second polling question. So we have said that these patients are usually visually impaired. Now, the, the next question is, poor visual acuity is an absolute requirement for Charles Bonnet syndrome. True or false? Okay, so can we show the results? Yes, I think that um, um, we have interesting numbers here. Seventy-six percent of people think that this is false, and in fact, yes. So, unfortunately, uh, we're going to close that and go to the next slide. Unfortunately, uh, we do not really have kind of a cutoff, right? I don't know how to go to the next slide. No. So uh, we know that just like, uh, again, um, Charles Bonnet's uh, grandfather, so people with this condition are visually impaired, but we have to look beyond visual acuity. So this condition can sometimes affect people with retrojeculate lesions, which characteristically cause homonymous visual field loss without affecting visual acuity. And on the other hand, there are case reports of people with 20-20 vision and, for instance, advanced Glaucoma, those uh, visual field changes presenting with hallucinations in keeping with Charles Bonnet. So, um, even though several studies have uh, described that you know it tends to occur in people with visual acuity of 2050 or less, so as I said before, there are more cases uh, uh, or people with uh, described with uh, better visual acuity. Generally speaking, so we have to take into account not just visual acuity but the whole visual function. So uh, in addition to vision loss, as I said before, the core features of Charles Bonnet syndrome include preserved cognition. Characteristically, these people are cognitively intact 
and many of these patients, I mean, one of the, the most common um, uh, indicators of preserved cognition is insight into the unreal nature of the condition. But be aware that insight may not really be uh, immediate, right? So many of these patients, uh, when they start hallucinating, they may not really realize that, that their hallucinations are unreal. So in particular, if they are hallucinating things that are appropriate for the context, right? So if they, if they live in a household where there are children and, and they see children, so they may actually think initially that they are real, but overall they gain insight over time. So remember that on the other hand, some neurodegenerative conditions may actually um, have preserved insight in particular at the beginning and, and a typical example is Parkinson's disease with visual hallucination. So unfortunately, we do not really have, um, we do not really have a diagnostic criteria for Charles Monet syndrome. So there is a little bit of variability in how it is described in different papers, but for, for the most part, um, so these patients usually have these core features, vision loss, insight, and cognition. Now, what do they, what, what do they, see, do they see, right? So these patients uh, with Charles Bonnet, usually uh, have complex visual hallucinations in addition to some simple hallucinations as well. So um, um, they may see flowers, they may see small people, Lilliputian uh, with colorful dresses, they may see animals, images of a bygone era. Sometimes they see a honeycomb pattern or like a brick wall pattern. Uh, sometimes they see distorted faces uh, and usually the sharpness of their hallucinations uh, is uh, different than the blurry vision due to the visual impairment. So remember, so we have to, we are more likely to see these patients because they, the, the condition is secondary to the visual impairment and, um, and we are more likely to see these patients or these patients are more likely to see us ophthalmologists when they present with these hallucinations. But it is important for us to be familiar with some of the other conditions that can actually present with visual hallucinations and, and, and sometimes they may represent a diagnostic challenge. So uh, the most common etiology of vision loss in people with Charles Bonnet syndrome is um, age-related macular degeneration. So, but it can occur as a result of uh, any type of vision loss from refractive to the occipital. But many of the conditions that lead to decreased vision are conditions that um, um, are more prevalent in the elderly and just like neurodegenerative conditions. So I'm going to talk specifically about uh, the three most common conditions that may present with visual hallucinations, uh, which we have to differentiate from Charles Bonnet. So Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia within the C-nucleinopathies group and within the tauopathies group, Alzheimer's disease. The other uh, forms of tauopathies, frontotemporal dementia, PSP, and uh, CBD uh, do not really have visual hallucinations as a prominent feature. So perhaps the most common or, uh, cause of neurodegenerative disorder presenting with visual hallucinations is Lewy body dementia. It, it is the second most common form of dementia after Alzheimer's disease in people over 65. And I think we need to be familiar with some of the clinical features of this condition to be able to inquire, um, to be able to inquire specifically about these features to uh, suspect that there might be something else um, uh, uh, and to look beyond Charles Bonnet syndrome. So these patients usually have dementia, so cognitive decline. But one of the features here is that cognition may, be, uh, may fluctuate, right? So this is recognized as one of the core clinical features, fluctuating cognition. They usually have more impairment in terms of executive function and visual spatial um, um, uh, uh, tasks, but uh, short-term memory, for instance, is not uh, uh, affected early in the course of the disease, or sometimes, you know, uh, when you do uh, uh, a MOCA, um, you can actually see that these patients usually have uh, naming is not too, much, too bad, short-term memory uh, is, not, uh, is not too bad. But one of the core clinical features is uh, the presence of visual hallucinations, typically well-formed and detailed. So another thing that we can actually inquire about is the presence of sleep disturbances. These patients often have uh, like very vivid dreams. They yell, they scream, they punch, they kick. Uh, it is, um, it's useful to ask the partner 
just to see if there is any history of an, uh, any injury, or sometimes they just sleep in on separate beds simply because uh, the patient behaves uh, too, too bad at night. Um, and another feature that is very characteristic of this condition is uh, Parkinsonism, right? So people with um, uh, Lewy body dementia may, may have one or more of features of Parkinsonism, including bradykinesia, tremor, and rigidity. So um, another entity that may present with Parkinsonian features is Parkinson's disease precisely, uh, up to a third of patients may have visual hallucinations. Uh, and characteristically, these patients are stable after several years of having the condition when they start hallucinating. Visual hallucinations are the most common, although they have, they have other um, um, sensory modalities. And, um, and the prevalence of uh, hallucinations tend to increase uh, it tends to uh, increase over time. So, and finally, and I am mentioning it here because this is a form of dementia that is relatively common, um, which is the most common form uh, actually. Um, uh, unlike the two other conditions, CBD and Parkinson's disease, um, and, uh, dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, does not really have motor features, does not really have Parkinsonian features, but they may have hallucinations late in the course of the disease. So these patients often have delusions um, and, um, and the presence of hallucinations is an indicator of early institutionalization. So um, for time constraints, I'm just going to stop here, but I am going to go back to the two initial cases. The first case it was um, that woman that had insight into the unreal nature of, uh, of her uh, hallucinations, uh, cognitively intact, uh, socially active, poor visual acuity. Yes, yeah, she did have all the core features of Charles Bonnet syndrome. The second one, even though she was referred for query Charles Bonnet syndrome, actually she um, didn't have insight. She actually was cooking for the hallucinations. So um, she, um, she did have fluctuating cognition, so the good days and bad days that the family was referring to. Um, she had uh, visual spatial uh, uh, problems. Um, remember that you know, she stopped uh, driving because she scraped the side of, uh, of her car on the garage door. And uh, the slowness that the family was concerned about was likely bradykinesia. So the patient eventually seen by a geriatrician and diagnosed with Lewy body. So this is uh, everything. Uh, well, thank you very much. Feels thank you, Thank you, Amadeo. That was an excellent review about this condition that is probably more common than we think. And um, as you said, people probably don't offer to say that they have it. Um, um, and if we ask, we may find that it's more common. Um, there are a few questions, a Q&A. So I'll let you go ahead and take a look at these questions and uh, I'll get you to just feel free to answer them. Perfect, yes. So there is a question here. Can a patient uh, have Charles Bonnet if they had good vision in one eye and poor vision in the other? So um, the, the theory of uh, Charles Bonnet uh, syndrome being the result of differentiation um, is the most widely accepted theory. And cases with unilateral vision loss uh, have been described. Uh, in this case, instead of differentiation, it will be under differentiation. So it has been described. And so it's a little bit more difficult to explain, but the answer would be yes. There are some case reports of people presenting with vision loss in this way, uh, developing hallucinations. So um, can this occur in children? So the uh, school age, the, again, um, from what I read, it, it, it can happen in kids. Uh, it's more common in, in the elderly and, and the prevalence increases over the years, but uh, definitely there are, case, uh, there are cases described in, in kids. Um, what, um, what is interesting is, is that it does not really seem to happen in people that are born blind. So, um, let me see. Uh, I'll read the next question to you. Yes. 
is CV is uh, is Charles Bonnet syndrome associated with occipital stroke different than CV uh, the Charles Bonnet syndrome uh, from ocular vision loss? No, it is considered part of the same. So it can happen as a result of any type of vision loss, and it is not really considered to be uh, different um, depending on the on the site of injury. Um, are some of the hallucinations in Parkinson's related to the drugs they take? Uh, this is a very, very good question. So even though it has also uh, has uh, often been related to dopaminergic medication, there is no difference between the dose of uh, dopamine uh, agonists they take and the hallucinations. Um, and even people that uh, receive a um, very high dose of, um, of uh, dopaminergic medications do not really seem to experience hallucinations more often than, than, than the others. So one of the things that uh, is believed to con uh, contribute is uh, the, the use of anticholinergic medication. So that's, uh, that group is the one that is uh, often uh, discontinued or reduced when patients hallucinate. Uh, how common is Charles Bonnet in children and how can you validate in clinic when parents wonder if the child is playing too many video games or has a problem in the eyes, brain? Well, I don't think that Charles Bonnet uh, is very common in children as opposed to, I mean, if, it, uh, I mean, uh, if we were to see it as a result of um, playing uh, too many video games, we would see an epidemic of that, um, but, uh, and I think that the most important thing to do would be just to make sure that uh, the, the child visual function is, is right. What is the best vision you have ever seen in Charles Bonnet? So my personal experience was 2050, but as I said before, patients with 2020 and, uh, and homonymous visual field loss or glaucoma to visual field loss have been described. Fantastic, uh, Amadeo. I do want to share one thing as I was reviewing this uh, topic. I just recently learned that, uh, you know, you described Charles Bonnet describing his grandfather as having this condition. At the time, he did not coin the term Charles Bonnet. And, but what is ironic is that Charles Bonnet himself had progressively lost vision between the ages of 20 to 40. And then he himself developed visual hallucinations. And then the Swiss scientist de Marcier described they coined the term Charles Bonnet. It was a fascinating and ironic it's, it's, story. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was uh, that was a great and fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, so, okay. So let's introduce our next speaker. <coughs> So it is my pleasure now to introduce our uh, next speaker, Dr. Ed Margolin. Dr. Margolin is a um, chief of neuro-ophthalmology service at the U of T, and despite doing it for the past 13 years, he says, with time he's loving neuro-ophthalmology more and not less. Uh, most of all, he enjoys teaching neuro-ophthalmology to ophthalmology and neurology residents. He otherwise loves loud screaming and lots of commotion as he gets to come home to experience it every day with his five kids. Um, Dr. Margolin will be giving us the, uh, it smells like the nerve, but it's not the nerve. Um, the podium is all yours, Dr. Margolin. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. And uh, I have to say, I'm um, slightly shocked that we have so many people here on the Sunday afternoon. So uh, it's really very humbling. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, one second, I'm just trying to figure out uh, where my slides are going to come. Um, should I share my screen, Dana, or uh, my slides will appear here? Can you hear me, Dana? Uh, you can share your screen uh, as you like. But I can, my slides can also be shown because I don't see them yet. Um, if you want to share your screen, you can share it with your PowerPoint and then... Uh, right, but, okay, okay. Come I'm up. Just, yeah, I'm just you know, going to do this right now. Two seconds. Oh, there it is. It's all there. Okay. Um, and uh, see if I'm going to try to advance it. How do I advance it? Um, can I advance it myself or um, you'll have to advance it for me? Uh, 
Uh, you should be able to advance them yourself, uh, Ed. Okay, one second. Got us. Okay, so I have prepared two cases. We might not have time for both, so maybe we'll just do one. Um, and um, initially, I was going to talk about a differentiating optic neuropathy versus maculopathy, but then I realized that this is something that usually ophthalmologists are really pretty good at. And um, I thought about the cases that, that we've had where the, uh, the diagnosis was suspected optic neuropathy, but turned out to be a retinopathy, and, and that I could come up with a few cases of. And I want to thank uh, Paul Freud, our ex-fellow, who um, really helped us uh, with this patient, who actually saw the patient, so it's really his case. So I titled this, Why Can't He See? Um, it's a 29-year-old man who came in to see us because he had a one-year history of, he described it as difficulty striking objects. He really had a very hard time coming up with any kind of better explanation than that. He said his vision was okay, but he said it's hard for me to track objects. And particularly difficult for him was playing sports and he loved playing sports and he said it's really difficult for him to do so, especially uh, basketball when he enjoyed playing at night. He said it's really hard for me to see the ball. And prior to him seeing, coming to us, he's already saw an ophthalmologist about two months ago and um, his vision was recorded as 2020 in each eye. He didn't have a relative aberrant pupil or defect, but he had very constricted formal visual fields. So when that was noticed, and he had normal exam otherwise, when that was noticed, an urgent MRI of the brain and orbits was uh, requested, it was performed, and it was normal. After that, he was referred to see a neurologist, Neurologist saw him and he also have not been able to find a reason for his visual symptoms and the conclusion of the very long neurology consult, you know, neurology consults tend to be very, very long. Uh, but the, the bottom line was unclear reasons for visual loss. So what do you do now? We saw him approximately one month later after he initially presented to an ophthalmologist uh, well, initially he presented to an optometrist, then he saw an opt ophthalmologist, then he received an MRI, then he saw a neurologist, so everything happened pretty quickly. And then we're seeing him, it's only a month later. And again, his vision is good, his vision is 20-20 in HI. Again, he has no relative afferent pupil or defect. And uh, his anterior and posterior segment exam appear completely normal. However, these are his visual fields. So these are 24-2 Humphrey visual fields. And as you can see, they're severely constricted in both eyes. Looks very quite symmetric. Um, so I wanna show you his posterior pole so you can judge for yourself, for yourself to see whether you think there are any abnormalities. Um, to us, we thought that the posterior pole of both eyes looked pretty normal. We really had a difficult time calling anything abnormal here. These are his peripapillary OCT, and you can see that they're also, you know, there's a little bit of thinning on the superior pole, but really not much to write home about. So I want to ask you a question, and um, I want to ask you, what do you think is going on here? Uh, and you can see the responses are there. Uh, do you think that he's faking it? Do you think that there is a subtle optic neuropathy going on here? Could he have a pathology in the occipital lobes? Maybe he has a maculopathy, or maybe it is a generalized retinopathy. So um, I will ask you all to please vote and see. I wanna see what you all think is going on here. Um, it is certainly somewhat puzzling, um, and I'm not sure when am I supposed to see the response? I guess it will appear. Okay, so most people said as a generalized retinopathy. We have a very, very astute audience here. So most of you think that he has generalized retinopathy. So I want to go over the question. So could it be functional? Um, it is certainly very possible that this is functional, but we still have not ruled out 
pathology in one more anatomical location. Um, specifically, the location that I'm thinking about, and you know, we were doing sort of a conversational, more uh, small group teaching. I would have asked you what you think is the one particular location we haven't really ruled out, and that is outer retina. Outer retina we haven't really looked at, but uh, still very well could be functional. Let's see. Let's see if we can advance the slides. It's not advancing. Could it be a subtle optic neuropathy? Well, it is remotely possible, but exceedingly unlikely. Um, as you all know, an optic neuropathy, any optic neuropathy other than glaucomatous optic neuropathy would preferentially affect central vision first. And there would almost always be with this kind of degree of visual field constriction, we'll see some degree of pallor. Uh, and these optic nerves looked pretty normal. So let's go to the next. Uh, option here. The next option here. Sorry, there's a delay with uh, moving to the next option. Could it be a pathology in occipital lobe? Well, I mean, it's theoretically possible if for somebody to have these type of visual fields with bilateral occipital lobe pathology that is sparing the macula. So it would have to be bilateral occipital lobe lesions. But I already told you that this man had an MRI, which was normal and presumably pathology that would accept bilateral occipital lobe would have been visible on imaging study and his imaging appeared normal to our review as well. Now, could it be a maculopathy? That is very unlikely because maculopathy, as you know, affects preferentially central vision, not peripheral vision. His central vision was 20-20. His problem was really in the peripheral vision. Could it be a generalized retinopathy? And that is certainly possible, and that's what most of you chose. So we have a very, very astute audience. So um, I want to show you the test that we did. One second. Here, polling question number four. Um, sorry, we moved very quickly, but I'm going to ask you already so the answer. Um, but what would you do next? Would you do a fluorescent angiography, a macular OCT? Would you do a Humphrey visual field by looking at the center vision? Would you do something that specifically looks more carefully at the papular macular bundle, the 10? Would you do 10 2 algorithm? Or would you perform visual evoked potential testing here? Um, so I want you to think about what we just discussed and what we're looking for. And I know all of you will choose the correct answer here. Um, and hopefully we'll get the results of the polling pretty quickly. Uh, so some people chose visual evoke potential. So we're pretty evenly split between fluorescent and geography, macular OCT, and visual evoked potential. So uh, let me tell you, we do not have very easy access to fluorescent and geography in our clinic. Neither do have a very easy access to visual evoked potential, but we certainly do have very easy access to macular OCT, and that is what we've decided to do, and there it is. So I want you to look at this macular OCT and try to tell yourself whether you can identify it, the, um, the pathology here, whether by looking at this macular OCT, you can tell what's going on in this patient, because the answer is here. So just spend a few seconds looking at the OCT and uh, we'll show you the answer on the next slide. Again, I apologize, there's a slight delay in moving the, uh, there it is, the images to the next slide. So there it is, I wanted you to show you, this is a macular of OCT of a normal control patient. And as you can see, there's all these layers that we really all should know very well about. And this is RP and this is really the photoreceptor area, this is the area, uh, really this, these are the rods and these are the cons. And you look at the patient in our case and he has complete obliteration of the outer retina outside of the foveal zone. So this is really, as we've all suspected, is likely a problem with the outer retina and uh, we're able to discern it on a macular OCT, which is widely available to mo in most of our offices. And again, I want you to see that the outer retina, which is 
very clearly delineated here in the normal patient is completely obliterated in this patient in our case, um, despite him having 20-20 vision. So um, the next test that we chose to perform in the clinic uh, was fundus autofluorescence. Fundus autofluorescence turns out to be a very useful test for patients with suspected autoretinopathies. Because fundus autofluorescence uh, demonstrates structures that autofluoresce. And the structures that autofluoresce, there aren't that many in the posterior pole. So the drusen, optic nerve head drusen, if it's located quite close to the surface, will autofluoresce. But also clumped, diseased retinal pigment, well, normal, re normal retinal pigment epithelium, the lip lipofusin in the normal RPE will, will autofluoresce. And then if the RPE clumps in the diseased RPE, you'll see these areas of hyperfluorescence. Uh, and that is what we're seeing here. And um, you can see either hyper or hypofluorescence. And so these um, bone spicules, which we would normally expect in the peripheral retina on the exam, we, which we couldn't see here, they are appearing already on fundus autofluorescence before they will become visible on the fundus exam. Now I want to show you, interestingly, this man had a ganglion cell analysis and ganglion cell analysis also showed diffused, very, very severe thinning. So I want to ask you, the defect here, remember, is in the outer retina, not in the inner retina. So I want to ask you this next call-in question. And here's a question. This ganglion cell analysis of the macular complex is abnormal. Why? Is it, do you think it's because there's an artifact? Do you think that's because there is reduced blood flow in the macula? Is there a transsynaptic degeneration? Or we don't know why, who knows? So I want you to think about uh, why is this ganglion cell analysis, so ganglion cell layer so severely thin? And remember ganglion cell is part of the inner retina and it's really a very distinct layer in the retina from the photoreceptor layer, which is diseased in this man. So I haven't told you his diagnosis, but you've all, I'm sure, guessed what it is. So I want you to think about that, and we'll talk about why that is important uh, while we're waiting for the results of the polling. And most of you said that this is likely transsynaptic degeneration. Very good. Um, and um, this is something that I've learned. I didn't know that before. Um, we saw this man. Uh, now, this is actually a very, very important thing to know because this man, as you've all guessed, has retinitis pigmentosa, and any therapy for retinitis pigmentosa is obviously dependent on functioning retinal ganglion cells. So once these ganglion cells are lost, whatever uh, visual recovery you can get will be very much limited by the amount of the remaining ganglion cells. So this is a very important question to know. What is going on with the ganglion cells before any therapy is undertaken? And the most prevailing theory is that you've all guessed that there is transsynaptic degeneration happening. But there are some trophic factors that are supposed to be released by photoreceptors that are keeping this ganglion cell alive. And once these trophic factors are lost, the ganglion cell will die as a result of that. And the second, theory is that there is a little bit decreased blood flow in the inner retina as well. And studies using OCT uh, angiography has confirmed that, that there is, in fact, slightly diminished blood flow to the retina as well. But the prevailing theory that there is transsynaptic degeneration, and this is a concept that we're seeing in multiple areas um, of neurology, uh, that really there's various tissues are really very much interdependent on each other. And this concept of traffic factors becoming really pretty sexy. And then really we showed that there are a lot of tissues in the brain that are really very independent on each other. And the same thing obviously apply to the retina as well. So several studies show very good correlation between the outer retina loss and the density, density of the ganglion cells in the retina as well. And was, as I said, that this is very important for any kind of treatment algorithm. So <clears throat> what is the take home message from this case? Whenever we see the, diff the patient with a generalized visual field constriction, you have a specific differential. We went through that. 
And uh, I want you to all remember that auto retina is a difficult area to, um, to, um, to, to it's, it's a very difficult area for us to identify a problem in because patient can have a completely normal exam yet have an auto retinopathy. So again, always keep that in mind. Fungus autofluorescence is very helpful in autoretinal disorders and transsynaptic signaling plays a role in the retina as well. So we're at 7.02. Um, Dana, I want you to tell me if we have time to do the other case or should we go in the post-test questions right away? You can, you have, uh, you know, probably five or six minutes. We have a few minutes, okay. So let's do the other case very quickly. Um, this is a second case. Again, I wanna thank Paul for this case. And I, I titled this case, Shimmering Lights, because that's the key thing here is the shimmering lights. And it's a 58 year old man who is completely healthy, nothing's the matter with him. And he came to see us because he says he's seen shadows in the periphery of his vision. And within these shadows, he's seeing the shimmering lights. He is an engineer, so he brought a drawing with us and I'm showing you the drawing. He showed you exactly where this area where he's seeing shadows and that's exactly where he is seeing these shimmering lights in. Uh, okay, let's try to see if I can. Uh, so this is this is the route that he took to come to us, and that's a fairly fairly um, regular route. He initially saw an optometrist, and then he saw an ophthalmologist, and eventually saw a neurologist. And he's had several imaging studies done. An ophthalmologist has ordered a CT scan of the brain that was performed, and it was normal because clearly based on this drawing, even you can see that the visual field defect kind of is resembling the bitemporal myopia, And he had an MRI scan of the brain done as well, and that was normal as well. His central vision was excellent. There was no relative afferent pupillar defect. And these are his Humphrey visual fields. It's a 24-2 algorithm. So I want you to look at this fields. And um, I think we have a polling question coming, if we can get to that. Sorry, there was something that's preventing me from doing that. Um, I want to show you his, um, his fundus pictures. This is, these are his fundi. And as you can see, really, there isn't much you can tell by looking at his fundi. They look really pretty normal. Uh, but when you do a ganglion cell analysis, you can see that he has a definitely thinning in the nasal portion of the ganglion cells in both eyes, which corresponds to his visual field defect. And when we did a peripapillary OCT, that hasn't really demonstrated very much of anything. So I want to ask you a next polling question about what you will do next. Will you repeat the CT scan? Will you repeat the MRI scan? Will you proceed with electroretinogram? Or will you do fundus autofluorescence? So well, what do you will do next? I want you to think about this case. I want you to think about what we discussed before. Um, and again, try to choose something that is more easily accessible, but yet is still very helpful. So I know that the answer is coming up shortly. Um, let's see, how do most people vote? Most of you have chosen fundus autofluorescence. And that is exactly what we've decided to do. So these are the uh, fundus autofluorescence pictures of this man. And I want to orient you a little bit. So remember that um, it's the lipofusin and the RPE that, that has an innate autofluorescence and this is this area is normal. You can see that this looks a little grayer. This is normal retinal pigment epithelial with the normal lipofusin that autofluoresces. And this area, and it's exactly in the nasal portion of the retina, corresponds very nicely to the visual field defects. This is the area where you can see diffuse, likely loss of retinal pigment epithelial cells because of this hypofluorescence here. So what do we have here? What do we do next? We we'll next perform the, um, the uh, OCT of the macula, and this is the center, and this is going to be nasal retina, and this is temporal retina. And if you go nasally, you can see again, 
this outer retina gets obliterated um, as you travel nasally. Again, corresponding to both the visual field defect as well as to the defect on autofluorescence. And this man ended up having a disorder called acute zonal occult autoretinopathy, which all of you have heard about. I mean, we don't see this disorder, thankfully, very often, but it's a disorder of retinal pigment epithelial. And the key thing that the patients complain about in, in Azor, and in, in fact, in many autoretinopathies, uh, they complain of scotomas with photopsia. So that's why the, uh, the shimmering, this is the title of the case, the shimmering lights case. So they're scintillating scotomas with this shimmering light within the scotomas. And that presumably is happening because of the discharge of the impulses within this diseased retinal pigment epithelial. So the diagnosis here was Azor. Uh, okay, Let's see if we can proceed further. And in Azor, the exam initially can appear completely normal. And then eventually you will see the atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelial. And in the affected retina, eventually you'll see arterial attenuation. When Fanta's autofluorescence is very useful um, in Azor, initially it shows hyperfluorescence as the diseased RPE cells clump together. And then it's followed by hypofluorescence as the, the RPE cells eventually die off and lose the lipofusin. And that's what we saw here. So what are the take home points from this case? Is that an outer retinopathy's posterior pole can look completely normal. And when we're seeing patients that really do not have any obvious optic neuropathy, yet you're suspecting an organic pathology, OCT of the macula is very useful in looking patients with outer retinopathies, as well as fundus autofluorescence. Both of these are really widely available to us in our clinics. The OCT of the macula and fundus autofluorescence are really not that hard to get, and they really are a go-to test for patients with outer retinopathies. So I think this is, we're done with that case. I'm gonna to try to oh, apologize. Let's do this last polling question for this particular case. Um, this, this, I've actually created several post-test questions on the topic that we'll discuss here, how to differentiate retinopathy from an optic neuropathy. So um, these are our post-test questions. If you answer them right, consider you that you've received 100% CME credits to that. So patients with autoretinal disorders will often complain of what? Headaches, shimmering lights, pain with eye movements, or photophobia. Um, and as we're waiting for, I'm hoping for really 100% response, correct answers here um, as to the what's the most common answer and everybody's chosen shimmering life and that is correct. Let's go to the next question. Uh, the next question is this. Um, when you're seeing the patient with outer, outer retinal disorders, which of the following is true? They often have normal retinal exam. They often have a relative afferent pupillary defect. They often have a hemianopic defect in visual fields or they often have optic nerve pallor. And again, I'm really hoping for close to 100% correct response rate uh, based on these two cases that we've discussed. And as you're all thinking about that, and uh, let's see, uh, perfect. Everybody got it right. It's a lot of the time patients with autoretinal disorders will have a normal retinal exam. Therefore, it can be quite tricky to diagnose. Uh, next question. Our next question is, which statement is true about fundus autofluorescence? And that one, I, it's a little wordy, so try to read it yourself. The first answer is it demonstrates hyperfluorescence in the late stages of autoretinal disorders. B, it demonstrates hypofluorescence in the late stages of autoretinal disorders. C, it is typically normal in late stages of autoretinal disorders. And D, it typically demonstrates patchy areas of hyperfluorescence in late stages of autoretinal disorders. So again, I'm hoping that everybody will get it right. 
And um, again, the, the purpose of these questions is not to insult anyone's intelligence, but to make sure that this information is retained. Um, let's see what we're gonna get. And uh, most of you got it right that in late stages of autoretinopathies, as the retinal pigment epithelial cells die off, they lose the lipofusion, therefore you see hypofluorescence in late stages of many autoretinal dis disorders. And uh, I believe we have one last question, which is coming up. Uh, and this is really a very short question. Which of the following is most useful in distinguishing retinopathy from autoretinopathy? Is it color vision? Is it the presence of relative afferent pupillary defect? Is that macular OCT and fundus autofluorescence? Or is it OCT and geography? And again, I'm hoping that most of you will choose the correct answer. I mean, you can argue about every one of these options that it can be useful, but I want you to think about which one of the following is most useful. Um, and uh, let's see. And again, I'm happy that most of you have chosen macular OCT and fundus autofluorescence. Uh, some have chosen relative afferent pupillary defect. It is definitely useful, but sometimes in asymmetric autoretinal dystrophy disorders, you can get relative afferent pupillary defect as well. So that is all for my talk. And let's see if we have any questions here. Um, um, Dr. Ng gave a really very astute remark. Um, uh, any other questions? Um, thank you for Reba. Anybody else any questions? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm hearing my voice as an echo. I'm hearing my voice as an echo. Uh, great uh, talk as, as great always. Talk as, as always. Um, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ed. Um, great yeah, talk as always. You, uh, you have the capacity to present these very complicated and, and, and complicated cases in a very concise and very clear manner. So thank you very much. So um, due to time constraints, we are going to move on to the next talk. And um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Albrecht. Uh, I have had the privilege of uh, working with Dana for the past uh, couple of years, just uh, organizing the neuro ophthalmology session uh, for the COS meeting. Uh, she is a neuro ophthalmology based uh, in Ottawa, and um, and she has a passion for teaching. So she noticed that being a teacher is in fact a vulnerable state, and to pursue teaching, uh, teaching, she had to be okay with being exposed to her own deficiencies. This is exactly why she thinks teaching was the best way for her to learn something well. Dr. Albrecht believes that teaching extends beyond the information uh, taught and expands to empowering the learner to have the tools to move forward independently. Dr. Albrecht's fun fact is that she keeps in touch with a bunch of her old friends from grade one on a regular basis. Uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Albrecht. Thank you, Amadeo. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Can someone tell me if they can hear me? Yes, anybody can hear me? Can I go ahead? I just need an okay, because I'm not sure. Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So uh, my talk is she's shaky or shaky, but really it's because if the uh, patient comes to you with shaky eyes, I get shaky. <laughs> um, everybody, you know, uh, at some point in their life hated nystagmus, um, and maybe some people still hate it, and uh, some people have come to perhaps embrace it. Um, so this uh, talk, uh, you know, you might ask yourself, why did I choose this talk on the last talk of the last session of the last day? I mean, that's what it is, so we're gonna just have to go through it. 
Okay, so um, I don't have any financial disclosures and by the end of this talk, I'm hoping to talk about main, two main things and try to simplify it as much as I can. Uh, five clinical steps to recognize a skew deviation and five clinical steps to examine for nystagmus. So we're gonna start with the case. So this is Mrs. R, she's a 58 year old lady who comes into my clinic and says, um, Dr. Albrecht, my past medical history is only significant for endometrial cancer for which I had a hysterectomy for. I had no chemo, I had no radiation, I have no other past medical history. I'm really healthy, I don't take any medications. My family and social history is all unremarkable. I was completely normal up until six weeks ago when all of a sudden I had a, um, an illusory movement of the environment, which I believe you call oscillopsia. And I also had uh, binocular oblique torsional diplopia. But in addition to those visual symptoms, I had some systemic symptoms, including persistent nausea and vomiting, an, an imbalance. I couldn't walk. I needed to sit on this wheelchair that you see here. Um, and I also had some dysphagia and some dyspnea. So Dr. Alberti, can you examine me and tell me what is going on with me? So I told her, Mrs. R, um, the neuroophthalmic exam has several components for which I will speak of only the strongly uh, pertinent positive points. When you have an um, uh, afferent system, you are going to check for best corrected visual acuity, for color vision, for confrontation visual fields, and for RAPD. In your case, the latter three were all within um, normal, but your best corrected visual acuity was 2070 bilaterally, and that's from your oscillopsia. Your efferent system also has some components, but the strongly uh, positive pertinent points were that you had some abnormal eye movements and you had a right hypertropia. And your neurological exam was significant for a cerebellar, uh, some cerebral, cerebellar signs, including dysmetria on finger nose testing, uh, dysdiotic kinesia on rapid alternating movements. You had a wide base gait and you could not really perform tandem gait. So in summary, Mrs. R, you're a 58-year-old female with diplopia oscillopsia, resistant nausea and vomiting, dysphagia and dyspnea, and ataxia of sudden onset six weeks ago. And on her exam, you have a right hypertropia and a nystagmus and some cerebellar signs. So now comes my first uh, poll question. So what are you going to do? Are you going to lift up your sleeves and try to figure this out? Um, you were easy, it's one of the easy ones, just send it to your ophthalmology jail, figure it out. Or follow up the next day so your colleague deals with it. And there's a hint there. Don't pick this one. Just take a video and call your neuro-op friend or I'm very comfortable with nystagmus and diplopia workup and I can handle it. So we can go ahead and show the results. Okay, so I'm glad nobody picked that third one. So this was just a fun one to see uh, how much um, uh, people are like, going after it. Perfect. Okay, so um, I told you that in her neuro-ophthalmic exam, we had the right hypertropia that was causing her diplopia, and she had uh, an astagmus that was causing her oscillopsia. So we're going to dissect these two components a little bit more. So when you have an, a hyperdeviation of the eye, you're going to think to yourself, where is this coming from? Is it a supranuclear cause or is it an infranuclear cause? If it's infranuclear, is it the nerve, the neuromuscular junction, or the muscle? And the things that pop into my mind when you have a vertical uh, hyperdeviation, first and the most common one would be a fourth nerve palsy, which is an infranuclear nerve problem. But other things can also cause a hyperdeviation, such as uh, a supranuclear cause, which is skew deviation, or another infranuclear neuromuscular junction cause, such as myasthenia gravis, gravis, or another infranuclear cause where the muscles are affected, such as thyroid-related orthopathy or any other restrictive um, pathology. The bottom two do not seem to be the case in this case, as obviously there is a neurological component to this case. So in five simple steps. Well, you all know the five steps. You all know the first three steps. The three steps are the Balchowski three-step test. So basically, when you have a fourth nerve palsy on the right, you're gonna have a right hypertropia, and then you're gonna examine for the hypertropia um, with your cover on cover testing in uh, right and left gazes. If this right hypertropia increases on contralateral gaze, it's because your inferior oblique is overacting because your superior oblique is underacting. And that supports a right fourth nerve. And when you do the head tilts, you're going to see that the hypertropia increases on right head tilt, 
And that's because your superiors are working here and because you have under action of your superior oblique, your superior rectus takes over and uh, hyperdeviates the eye. So that is a pattern of a fourth nerve palsy. Now, in order to further uh, support this, you're going to check for torsion. And because the superior oblique is in a cyclotorter, um, if that's dysfunctional, you're going to have a um, excyclotorsion because of the excyclotorter is taking over. And how do you check for that? I like the double Maddox rod. And these are vertical cylinders. And what you do is you put them vertically on uh, each eye. And then you ask the patient, uh, you shine a light in the patient's uh, eye, and that's what they'll see if they have a right hyperdeviation um, with a component of torsion. So because the eye on the right is hyperdeviated, the eye, the line that they're going to see is the bottom line. And because it's excyclotorted, it's going to be at an angle. What you have to ask the patient is just make that angled line parallel to the other line. And what they'll do, if you just look over here at the right red Maddox rod, they're going to excyclotort that in order to fix that line. And that supports the excyclotorsion of that hyper eye, which supports the right fourth nerve palsy. Another way of doing it is that if you, an inferior, the inferior one third of the nerve, if you draw a horizontal line, it will bisect the fovea. So if you draw that line here, you'll see that the fovea is below, and that will tell you that this eye is excyclotorted. The other thing is uh, what you can do is a supine test. And remember, the fourth nerve doesn't really care where your head is. So the double vision is not going to change whether you uh, sit up the patient or lie them down. So these are the five steps that will tell you that this supports a right fourth nerve. First, uh, understand what a skew deviation is. So now you're sitting and you're listening to this lecture and you're sitting up straight and your eyes are aligned together. But then I said an intriguing point. So you said, hmm, so you lifted your head, you tilted your head to the left. When you tilt your head to the left, your left eye is going to go up and in and your right eye is going to go down and exequitur. This is just the static tilt reaction. It's a normal physiologic oc ocular tilt reaction. And that happens because you have something called the trochilo-ocular pathway. You don't have to know exactly this pathway, but just get an idea that there is something called the utricle within the autolithic organs within the inner ear. It's going to talk to these um, aculomotor nuclei, the fourth and the third, um, by, by this pathway. So it's going to have uh, fibers going to the vestibular nucleus, and then it's going to cross over to go up all the way to the um, third and fourth nuclei in order to be able to move the eyes up and in and down and out, okay? And so let's damage the right side. And everything in the vestibular system is all about balance. So normally you'll have to have 10 units here, 10 units here. But if you have zero units here, then this is relatively overacting. And you know, already know what happens when this is acting. Your brain is gonna think that the head is tilted to the left, and that's what's going to happen with the eyes. The left eye is gonna go up and in, and cyclotorted, and the, left, and the right eye is gonna go cyclotorted and down. But your head is not tilted to the left, it's actually straight. And that's when you get a, a skew deviation. And actually, on the contrary, there is a compensatory, or not really a compensatory, um, head tilt, but it's really what happens in the pathological ocular tilt reaction where the patient will tilt their head to the, towards the lower eye, um, and that in component with the torsion and the hyperdeviation is called the pathological ocular tilt reaction. So the skew deviation is the hyperdeviation, and the torsion and the head tilt all compose the ocular, uh, pathological ocular tilt reaction. So now that you know what a skew deviation is, let's talk about how we can distinguish it from others in five simple steps. So you already know the three-step test, the Bielchowski three-step test, which you're gonna do for any patient you see with a hyperdeviation. And as a general rule, there are exceptions to every rule, but as a general rule, when it does not follow the three-step test pattern, think about a skew deviation as a possibility. And the fourth step is going to also help determine whether the hyper eye is encyclotorted. If it's encyclotorted, and you see the Maddox rod here is encyclotorted, or if the, uh, when you draw the line, the fovea is actually above, then that tells you that that right hyper eye is encyclotorted. That supports a skew deviation. Also, the utricle does care where your head is in space. And so basically, if you lie the patient down, you don't need your utricle as much. And so the skew deviation, the double vision, or the distance between the two images is going to improve 
not in all the cases, but in some of the cases. And if you find that the patient says, oh, the distance between the two images really collapsed almost to 50% of what it was when I was sitting up, then that supports a skew deviation if it's present. Our patient has had a skew deviation. So her um, cover uncover did not match a fourth nerve palsy. Her right eye was encyclotorted and her supine test improved um, the distance between the two images. Now for the second component of her exam, oh, and the skew deviation is basically localized in anywhere in the posterior fossa from the thalamus way down to the medulla, even cerebellar connections. So anywhere there, it can cause a skew deviation. The second component is that this patient had nystagmus. And to tell you the story about nystagmus, um, I'm going to bit first show you the video of the patient. And for this video, I, there is a poll question that's coming after. And the poll is going to ask you, what did you see in this video? And this is not a clear cut video because, I mean, this is real life. This is what the patient is gonna come. It's not, um, you know, uh, an absolutely clear, like very clear what's uh, happening there, but I want you to just focus. And it's also unfair that I'm gonna show it to you once. I, I mean, I look at the patient for an hour sometimes to really decipher what's going on, but uh, try your best, you know, and see what you can uh, pick up from this, okay? All right. I'll also, um, show you the, I won't show you down gaze because there's nothing going on in down gaze. Open your eyes, open your eyes, good. Look up. I know I should get a tripod. Okay. okay, so I'm not gonna show you the down because there's not much going down there. But what did you see? So we're gonna pull up the uh, polling question here. What did you see? Did you see upbeat nystagmus? Did you see square wave, uh, let's call them saccadic intrusions? Uh, did you see gaze evoked nystagmus um, or all of the above? Okay, let's get the answers. Great, okay, and that is correct. There is all of the above. So I'm gonna show it to you again and we're gonna go through it a little bit um, together. So what I want you to pay attention for is once I turn on this video, I want you to look at the beating up, okay? This is the first thing that you'll see. It's a bit clearer in the beginning of the video. So you see those upbeats. And then you see those horizontal saccadic intrusion, they're fast, fast movements. And then there's a horizontal gaze about nystagmus when the patient is looking to the right. Also, when the patient is looking to the left, but not as clear, but if you look at this eye, you'll see a few beats to the left. And then when the patient looks up, there is an increase in the amplitude of the upbeat nystagmus. And when the patient is looking down, nothing much is happening. Okay, so nystagmus. So let me tell you a story about this medical student who um, loved everything about medicine, particularly loved um, ophthalmology. So he applied for the ophthalmology residency and then he got in and he was ready. He had the scalpel, he's doing cataracts, you know, all that fun stuff. And then he stumbles upon nystagmus. And that I think was maybe my story too. So, um, but then this person embraced the fear and um, further uh, wanted to know a little more and get to know uh, this beast a little uh, further. And that's what uh, made um, all the difference in understanding the, how to approach nystagmus. So the first thing that this resident did was to understand the definition of nystagmus. So nystagmus is an involuntary rhythmic movement and it starts with a slow phase. So there is a slow phase somewhere there. If it's a slow, slow, it's a pendular. If it's a slow, fast, it's a jerk. That's it. And nystagmoid eye movements, which we call saccadic intrusions, are more irregular and they're episodic and they're very fast. They're fast, fast, fast. There's no slow phase there, okay? So I'm gonna show you a few videos um, just as a sort of a training the eyes. And these are um, courtesy to Dr. Z, who's really the father of nystagmus. And I'm gonna ask you if you see, I wish I could see the chat, I can't for some reason, but um, I wanna know if you guys see the slow component here. So you all uh, notice that the patient, the eye is going up slowly, but then it's beating down and that's a down beating nystagmus. You, you notice that it's a slow, there is a slow phase and there's a fast corrective phase. So that's a jerk nystagmus, it's beating down towards the corrective phase. It's called the down beating nystagmus. 
So now you're comfortable saying this is a down beating is diagnosed. Let's look at this one, and I want you to, I want to ask again, do you see a slow phase? And if you do see a slow phase, do you see a fast phase? And the slow is actually a spectrum. Like it could be very slow, but it could also be less slow. So this is actually a slow. It's not a fast, so it's a slow slow, and there is no fast component. This is a pendular type of nystagmus. And the most common um, cause for an acquired pendular nystagmus is a demyelinating process. Now I'm gonna show you this, this one. And in this one, um, I'm sure everybody agrees that there's really no slow phase whatsoever. It's all fast, fast. It's almost like I have fast forwarded this video for you. And this is, um, as you all um, know now, is um, called opsoclonus or um, saccadomania. It's almost like the possessed eye look. And uh, this um, is really just, a fast, fast phases all over. It's a different trajectories and uh, it's called optoclonus when it's in different trajectories and it's called ocular flutter if it's only horizontal. But the workup is the same for both. And the most common um, or the top two differential diagnosis for this type is parainfectious or uh, paraneoplastic. There are other causes, of course, but these would be the top two that you think about. So it's important to differentiate between nystagmus and nystagmoid because they can be different workups and different um, differential diagnosis and different localizations. So um, when you take when you see nystagmus, of course, um, history is always key in anything in medicine, because the causes may be uh, demyelination. So you ask about neurological symptoms, you ask about family history for hereditary causes, you ask about cancer, anything related to cancer, infection causes. You want to ask about the social history for drugs and alcohol, medications like anti-epileptics, uh, vestibular uh, symptoms. Um, the patient may, of course, uh, have no vision, and that could be the cause of the um, acquired nystagmus. They also can have structural abnormalities such as Arnold's carry, uh, which was one of the causes of um, diabetes nystagmus. So after you take a history, you're going to do a full neuroophthalmic workup and a neurological exam. And if you had to do one thing, you probably want to do an MRI with contrast with particular attention to where you think the localization may be. Of course, there is more to, to the workup of nystagmus than just that, but um, if you had to and you uh, and then you can send it to a neuroophthalmologist for a complete workup and the neuroophthalmologist may even send it to a neurologist for further workup. I'm now gonna go into the treatment because um, the, the treatment is really of the underlying cause, but there are many uh, different ways to try to manage nystagmus. But what I wanna give you today is five clinical steps to take home on how, what to do when you see nystagmus. So first of all, um, to look for it. Um, because sometimes a patient comes to your office and the patient is 20-50 vision and everything else is completely normal. And you are gonna say this patient is functional or um, has nothing really on exam. And it could be that this patient has a very fine type of nystagmus that you can only see with a slit lamp, or even like if you just see your muscle light and look at the eye, you may pick it up. And that um, can be easily missed. Um, and so look for the nystagmus um, as, uh, as part of your workup, if you're, especially in those patients um, who have unexplained visual acuity um, decrease. The second thing is, um, is there a slow phase? So if there is a slow phase, then you think it's an nystagmus. If it's a slow, slow, it's a pendular. If it's a slow, uh, fast, it's a jerk. And check it in all gazes. So is it in primary gaze or is it gaze evoked? Once you do that, then you want to recognize the type. And because nystagmus is a big lecture, I had to pick and choose what, to, what types of nystagmus to put on this list. And I tried to choose more of the localizing um, nystagmuses. So you have the downbeat, the upbeat, the seesaw nystagmus, which kind of looks like this with one eye going up and encyclotorting while the other eye go down and encyclotorting, and then the opposite happens. Conversions, retractions, and nystagmus, which is not a real nystagmus, but it's from co-contraction of the third nerves. And it's going to cause convergence because of that medial recti um, contracting together, and it's going to cause retraction because of the superior and inferior uh, recti contracting as well. Um, it's not a true nystagmus, um, but it's localizing. Uh, and then periodic alternating nystagmus, you see the patient, you see a right beating nystagmus, and then like two minutes later, you see a left beating nystagmus, um, that's called a part periodic alternating nystagmus. If you don't see it in primary, but you see it in 30 to 45 degrees from, uh, extent, from uh, uh, primary gaze, um, either right, left, or up and down, then that's called gaze evoked nystagmus. Once you try to recognize the tap, then you try to localize it. We now uh, know that most of the downbeat nystagmus localizes to the cervical medullary junction, upbeat nystagmus is more in the brainstem, uh, seesaw nystagmus usually in the cellar region, convergence retraction nystagmus in the dorsal midbrain, 
periodic alternating nystagmus, usually in the uh, nodulus of the cerebellum. And gaze evoked nystagmus, really not a localizing, but you know, we know that there is a problem in the neural integrator system of the um, eye, uh, which is, um, oh, sorry, the brain, which is e localized within the brainstem and in the cerebellum. So our patient had um, upbeat nystagmus and horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus. And you know, the, the two slides that are coming now are just a bonus slide of if you really wanted to know why these two things happen. So um, for upbeat nystagmus, um, for a normal, um, you know, for a normal um, uh, process, what, for example, if you, you know, remember when you were a kid and somebody said, did you eat that chocolate? And you're like, no. And then your, your chin goes down and your eyes go up. That process requires our anterior semicircular canals to talk to the third nerve subnuclei for the eye to roll up while our chin goes down. So the superior rectus inferior oblique, okay? And for this to happen, the anterior semicircular canal goes through a pathway in order to reach that, these third nerve subnuclei. So the uh, anterior semicircular canal is then going to talk to something called the superior vestibular nucleus that's in the rostral medulla. And then that is going to the third nerve uh, nucle subnuclei through something called the ventral tegmental tract. The third nerve is going then to go to supply the eye, the, the proper muscles. Anywhere along this pathway, uh, you're going to get an upbeat type of nystagmus. So let's say you damage that pathway. There is going to be, uh, the brain is going, because everything's about balance, the brain is going to think that your chin is actually going up. And so your eyes have, you know, your posterior, the posterior canals are now overacting. So the eyes are going to go down, but as a corrective phase, they're going to go up. Okay? And that's why you have upbeat nystagmus. As for horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus or gaze evoked nystagmus in general, we're gonna have the example of a horizontal left gaze. So I want to look to the left, but I don't want to move my head. So on a look to the left, I have two steps to do. I have to move my eyes to the left, that's a pulse, and I have to keep them there, that's called a step. For the pulse, my, front, my right frontal eye field is going to talk to the omnipause neurons on the left side, and then gonna say, the omnipause neurons, their job is to suppress the CADs. The right frontal eye field is gonna say, hey, OPN, can you loosen up a bit? We want to look to the left. So the omnipause neurons are going to trigger uh, the PPRF, which is a supranuclear organ within the pond, to signal the sixth nerve nucleus to move the eyes to the left. So you see the eyes have gone to the left here. And that's because the sixth nerve nucleus has motor nuclei to the left lateral rectus, and it has um, interneurons that go to the contralateral medial rectus. So you moved your eyes to the left, and that's called the pulse, and that's great. But now you need to keep it there. That's the step. And for it to stay there, it's, um, we need something called the neural integrator system. For the horizontal gaze, there, uh, there are a couple of nuclei within the medulla called the nucleus propositus hypoglossi, MPH, and the medial vestibular nucleus, MBN. These are in the medulla. And they are going to signal uh, those, you know, the sixth nerve nucleus um, ultimately to keep the eyes looking to the left. So what happens if you damage this neural integrator system? The eyes need to stay there against the elastic forces of the orbit. And if the step is not performing its job, then the eyes are going to drift, but you're gonna keep pulsing it to the left because you still wanna keep looking there. And that causes your gaze evoked nystagmus. For horizontal gaze, they are these nuclei. For um, vertical gaze, it is the INC, the interstitial nucleus of Cajal on the rostral midbrain. And for, uh, there is a very important calibration that comes from the cerebellum, the flocculus, and the paraflocculus. So if you damage those, you can get a global gaze evoked nystagmus. So this is what's happening. So nystagmus, look for it. Is there a slow phase? Check it on all gazes, recognize the type, and localize it. So going back to our patient, she's the 58-year-old with six weeks sudden onset of diplopia from her skew deviation, oscillopsia from her nystagmus, the upbeat and the gaze evoked, persistent nausea and vomiting, dysphagia and dyspnea, and ataxia. So she was getting better over the past week, she says, actually, on her own without intervention. So here is um, moving to the next polling question, is what are you going to do now? If you had... These are all correct, I'm going to tell you, but if you had the, the first step is which one of those are you going to be doing? And we can have the answers now. 
Great. And that's exactly uh, what I chose to do as well. So I ordered an MRI and sent the patient to neurology, and neurology did really a lot of the other workup. So here's where the um, action was happening. This is an axial view of a flare image showing hyperintensity within the medulla. You know when you open your, ha you open your mouth and you see those tonsils, especially in kids, they have these big tonsils. You see, it's kind of like here. So this is, these are the tonsils of the cerebellum. That's what, how you know you're in the level of the medulla. So, or at least in that area. So this hyperintensity right here that you see, okay, that's a medullary uh, hyperintense lesion. And I'm gonna just show you here that it actually extends to the dorsal aspect of the medulla. So if we were to draw it, it's over around this area. So we now explained why this patient had the upbeat nystagmus. Yeah, absolutely, it can go through here. Um, the uh, gaze evoked nystagmus, yeah, it can definitely go through this you know, uh, process or the location. We also explained the skew deviation, right? Um, but what about the systemic symptoms? So persistent nausea vomiting is uh, likely from affection of the area post syndrome. The bulbar symptoms, the dysphagia and dyspnea is re related to involvement of the 9th, uh, 10th, 11, uh, 12 uh, cranial nerves. And the ataxia or the other cerebellar signs was also related to involvement of the inferior cerebellar peduncle, which is also known as the restiform uh, body. So what do you think the diagnosis is? There is one thing that I said in the history that is going to direct you. All of these are done, the differential diagnosis, but what is one thing that um, she said in the history that directs you to a potential uh, diagnosis? So here's the poll. We can have the answers. Okay. So, um, that's great. Like all of them are correct to think, uh, absolutely. Um, in her case, when she told me that she was getting better within the past week, um, I thought that maybe this is a demyelinating process, but definitely everything else was done for the workup. So all the answers are correct. Um, and in the end, it turns out that this patient had MOG, a brainstem MOG encephalomyelitis. And MOG is the MOG associated disease, it's a, it's a myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein and antibodies against the smog causes uh, different manifestations for which what we know is mostly optic neuritis. But uh, we don't think about it when, the, when it comes to the efferent system. And uh, it turns out that about 30% of patients with MOG associated disease can have brainstem involvement at uh, one time in the course of their disease. I'm not gonna talk about this uh, condition. Um, the point of this talk wasn't to really reach this diagnosis, but it's more of how to approach a case um, with these findings. So in conclusion, a thorough history is always key to directing you to the diagnosis. Five steps to recognize skew deviation. If it doesn't follow a three-step test uh, rule in general, um, look for a skew, look for the torsion of the hypertrophic eye if it's encyclotorted, it supports a skew and uh, the supine test, if it improves, it also supports a skew. Uh, five steps to approaching nystagmus, look for it. Is there a slow phase to just confirm that it's a nystagmus? Uh, look for it in all gazes, recognize the type and try to localize it. So I hope that by the end, we're all a bit more solid about this talk and I'm happy to entertain any questions. And we can definitely also entertain questions to um, Dr. Margulin. I think um, we didn't have any time to ask him the questions that we wanted. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and go back to this. So can we get um, our speakers on the, um, so we can ask them the questions? Okay. Uh, Ed, do you want to answer the questions um, that are re relevant to your talk and then we'll go from there? Yes, I said, I think I'll try to answer them in writing. Um, somebody wants to know, were there any trisonal changes in the OCT? There were. Um, just want to give you a little preamble that of course, the purpose of my talk was not to present you a case as a retinal expert, but just to show you um, a case of an outer retinopathy that presents to us. 
Uh, of course, this was managed alongside the retina. Um, um, there is a question for Dana. How do you distinguish pathological gaze involved nystagmus from physiological end gaze nystagmus? So, you know, that's a great question. Physiological end gaze nystagmus is usually at really the end of the gaze. It's a few beats, like, for example, like six or seven beats, and then it stops. It's usually symmetrical and very fine. Um, and gaze evoked is really at 30 to 45 degrees. It starts a, a lot sooner than all end gaze, and it's clearly um, higher in amplitude usually than that, and it's persistent. There is also a, another um, question for right hypertrophy. Don't forget dissociated vertical deviation. That is one that is often forgotten in the differential diagnosis. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. Absolutely. Um, what else do we have here? Any more questions? I wanted to, um, oh, this was very good. Uh, Dana, um, do you use in clinic, I found something that I've been using recently, which helps me in um, taking care of patients with fourth nerve palsies, because we see a lot of patients with fourth nerve palsies, and uh, we always try to decide whether to image them or not image them. So one thing that I've been using recently based on a paper, a fairly recent paper that um, showed that fourth nerve palsy that is um, that is bad, that's important not to miss, gets gets worse when you're looking, the, the hypertrophic gets worse than down gaze. So I, I don't know if you use it or not, but I started imaging all of those patients. I don't image the ones where the hypertrophic gets better than up gaze, because that's been shown to be almost always to be benign in nature. In other words, the hypertrophic worse than down gaze image, better in up gaze, as a worse than up gaze, uh, do not image. Yeah, that's a Jonathan Tro paper. It's a. Uh, use that? I do. And it's something that I observed actually in the clinic as well. Um, and uh, the two things that I make me want to image is the other thing that makes me want to image is, and although I, every when I imaged was normal, was the presence of torsion, uh, like subjective torsion. Um, I don't know how often you guys see that. I, I see it more often than I th thought in congenital fourth nerve palsies, but I still image them and it's normal in the end. Uh, but other signs also um, support that it's a congenital, for example, higher fusional amplitudes and, you know, the facial asymmetry. You, you try to rely on multiple factors to direct you whether you want to image those patients or not. I only had one patient that I imaged that had a schwannoma in the fourth nerve, um, but that's really, that's the only one. Mm -hmm. And that was based on he did not have high vertical fusional amplitudes, and that's why I wanted to image him. We had this discussion with, with Jonathan Michelli and our ex fellow um, that we thought he, who, is, who has also picked up some schwannomas that perhaps we're not picking them up because we don't image them often enough. So that could be, I guess, I guess nothing really changes if you do that, but it was great. Um, and the other question I had is um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish skew from the fourth. Um, tell us your wisdom in like two sentences. How do you tell them apart? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, uh, I did say as a general rule, the skew doesn't follow a pattern of a fourth, but in reality, it can. It can. Um, yeah. Definitely. And so I, my, my go-to is really the torsion and the supine test. Um, but I didn't find the supine test really like, you know, it's maybe it's me, I'm not doing it properly, but I don't find that it's that really helping me, but it's you really... Know? that I rely more on. Of course, what I rely on as well is the symptoms because the history plays a huge role in what I'm going to do. If the patient has obviously some neurological and vestibular and all that good stuff, and I'm going to think skew, you know, uh, a little more than a fourth. A fourth should be like a really like benign presentation, just the diplopia gradually getting worse, um, but nothing really neurological. So history and exam really like, you know, specific, specify towards those differentiating features. I agree with you about the supine test. And, you know, there was a paper in JAMA that also showed that it's not, not as helpful. It's particularly in acute situations, it's not right. super right. helpful. What about you, Amadeo? What are, what are your kind of pearls for distinguishing the fourth from the, um, from the skew? 
Well, I, I think, um, as uh, Dana said, um, so I, I pay attention to torsion and the, yeah, the supine test as well. Um, I must say that um, uh, our knowledge on, on skew deviation and ocular tilt reaction, I, I, I mean, I, I try, just try to look for the, the elements of the ocular tilt reaction because, I mean, um, uh, skew deviation is one of the, the elements of the ocular tilt reaction, right? So I just uh, look for abnormal head position. I just try to um, follow the, the three-step test and, and see if, uh, if there is, if, if it actually uh, follows that, um, just to differentiate it from Faulkner policy. But I mean, I, I, as Dana said, so I try to pay attention to torsion and the supine test. The, um, I think that uh, over time there may there must be some adaptive changes that occur, and and that's why it is most likely to be affected over time the, the supine test or more positive over time. But I yeah I I read that one about uh, not being helpful in, in in acute cases. So yeah I I must say that I haven't seen many patients with an acute onset, uh, uh, or I don't really see many patients with acute onset uh, skew deviation. Usually they come to me after a while, so. Got it. I always found that, I mean, it's not that common for us to see a skew, but they usually have another associated neurological sign, either an nystagmus or an ataxia or INO, or usually there is something else going on in the brain stem wise, but I agree, if not, always easy and can be competent, can be incompetent, can sometimes kind of um, agree, can um, mimic the fourth. So I just want to bring it out there. It's not always very easy. It's not. And, you know, I think um, we also have to err on the side of caution, uh, for example, in patients who, let's say, you know, because this is an example, a real example, a patient that I had when I was a fellow, so it was actually the next patient and he worked this up. Um, and this patient presented to us with a skew deviation, um, but she had breast cancer and it was active breast cancer and she was imaged and there was a lesion um, within the brainstem that, um, you know, uh, supported the manifestation of a skew, you know? And so, um, and that was an isolated skew, but it was amongst a, a very important part of the history, which is that she had breast cancer. So um, always history is really key to really directing you to what to do. There is a question that's a good question from an anonymous. Uh, how do we observe measure alignment with this nystagmus picture? That's a great question. It's not always easy, um, but you, know, um, you are still able to um, get even an idea which if, if the alignment was clear enough to distinguish from the nystagmus, um, because yes, nystagmus can get in the way, absolutely. And it's sometimes a bit difficult. I don't know if uh, my colleagues here have any more, have any you know, trip to, tips or tricks on um, getting that uh, cover on cover test a bit clearer in the, in the picture of nystagmus. Any thoughts? The question was, how do you how do you observe nystagmus? How do you measure it? Well, how do you measure the alignment? Like when you do a cover and cover test, but you have a nystagmus underlying, sometimes it's a little bit hard to to see that misalignment. I think practice. I mean, yeah, you, you do the best you can. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes you can't do it if it's really very coarse nystagmus. Right. Don't forget, just one more thing, that don't forget that uh, until uh, the late 80s and the early 90s, so uh, skew deviation was always described as a, as a vertical misalignment that didn't fit the pattern of a Faulkner policy. Uh, and it was uh, connected with all manifestations of posterior fossa lesion. Now we know a lot more about the pathways and, and the different components of the ocular field reaction. And, um, so, but yeah, it's always useful to, to find uh, um, or to look for other uh, features of posterior fossa involvement. Sorry, I just lost connection for a few seconds before. I don't know if uh, you guys already went over it, but I just wanted to, no, to, to just give my opinion. Absolutely, agreed. I think we are uh, going to wrap up the session. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Margolin, and uh, you know, excellent talks. 
Um, I think uh, we want our um, audience to fill up an evaluation form just before they leave. I want to thank um, the COS organizer, organizers for doing this. It's been a lot of hard work for them. We really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you speakers for coming. Thank you um, attendees for coming. This is amazing, 218 attendees in the Nurov and it's a Sunday night. Uh, I want to take a screenshot of this. <laughs> All right, it's a wrap up. Thanks guys.